Um, but I thought it was really ter terrific how Tanya's been doing the building with Jesus, and then Tom's been on grace, and then today it was the decision that Kevin would speak on walking in that grace, walking as you're building with Jesus. So today, um, Kevin's going to be sharing the word with us, and uh, so come on up. Yeah. Welcome, good morning, good morning, great to be with you today. Thank you, Debbie, for that wonderful presentation of your heart and life. It's terrific. We're victorious people. We're on the winning side, right? We're victory people. We're overcomers. We're Nike people, right? We're, we're, we're the swoosh people, uh, you know, Nike, that's a New Testament word, Nike. It means victory. Every time you see those shoes, just say, yeah, New Testament victory or something. We're going to talk about walking today. I thought to myself, I, I'm not sure that I've ever heard a teaching on, specifically on the idea of walk and walking. I mean, I've heard people talk a lot about walking with God and, and sort of a general label of Christian living, but just a little bit more digging on the idea of walking with God and what the walking part means. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity, as always, to be here today. And my prayer is that by the end of our few minutes together today, that you'll have a little bit deeper perspective on what it means to walk what it means to walk the Word, what it means to walk by the Spirit, what it means to walk with God or Christ. Why does God use the, the term walk? Um, it it's, has been an exciting digging. I learned more myself in the process of going through dozens of resources and books and online resources and trying to throw stuff together and what not to say is, is a huge part of it. Um, so life is a walk. Yeah, we stay the course and we are in step with Christ. A lot of terminology today about walking and being in step and moving forward. Debbie's moving forward, prime example uh, in her work situation, moving forward. So if you feel like you need to move forward in a fresher way or in a more empowered way, a more victorious way, then maybe God will tell you something today. Um, it, it's not so much what we say up here that is what you take home from gathering with believers. It's what God says to you, Lenny, what He stirs in your heart as a result of the teaching, the music, the prayers, the manifestations. God should be talking to your heart uniquely when you're around God's people. It's not just, give me the notes, give me the words to the songs. You know, I'll, I can send you the slides if you'd like, if anybody wants them. But it, it's not just an exchange of information. Mary, we, we want an exchange of, of inspiration when we're together. We want an inspiration to lead to transformation. If it was just, well, I don't go to church because I can get that information, <laughs> well, if it's just exchange of information, you certainly don't need to be here. We wouldn't send it to you uh, online in an email or a video or, or just watch it. But there's something that happens when God's people are together that is transformational, that'll make you more like Christ. So, I want to think about walking as an idea in Scripture. I know this button is going to work. Come in, Tokyo. There we go. About a month ago, Micah, my son Micah, and his wife Sarah and their son Levi were in visiting our house. And a lot of the rest of our family was in the same particular weekend, so we had uh, kind of a house full. And I remember specifically waking up that morning, and the very first thing I thought of was, I need to grab my grandson Levi, 
They live in Michigan. They live in Midland near Debbie. And I need to grab a hold of him and we need to go take a long walk in the park. There's a beautiful large park near us in Englewood. And it's, it's not the kind of thing that I normally would think about. A lot of times when we get all the people together, all the kids, I'm happy for the ladies to talk among themselves because they, they know what the kids are doing and not doing and liking and not liking. And I'm happy just to kind of go with the flow and not coordinate the universe, you know what I'm saying? But that morning, I didn't care what else was going on. I needed to take a walk with Levi. And this is Levi at camp this year. I had three grandchildren at camp, at Yes Camp. And I remember having three children at Yes Camp 28 years ago, 27 years ago. Uh, so it was remarkable to look out in the same room and see grandchildren staring back at me. And Levi was one of those. And this is him. We sat out at the campfire and he very kindly and lovingly put his arm around me. And, and that's not always what grandchildren want to take the time to do. And it just blessed my heart so much. But we went on a walk that day. We walked for an hour and then went to a restaurant and had brunch. And it was the most time I think I've ever spent with him at one time. And so I thought it was a real special opportunity. Is it a battery thing? I will do what thou wilt. Okay, we're going to talk about how three things. Walking simplifies our walk against our adversary and our walk with Jesus. Walking simplifies our walk against our adversary and our walk with Jesus. Uh, next slide, please, Casey. Walking simplifies. Next slide. We'll get right into this. This says, but I fear lest I somehow, okay, I'm just going to read it off of here because my eyes and that distance is not working this morning. I need to change the batteries in my retina. Uh, <laughs> but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, Paul says, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Sometimes my mind gets corrupted, Chris, from the simplicity that's in Christ. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I can get deep in the weeds of trying to figure out the spiritual aspect of my life, what I'm doing, what I'm not doing, what I ought to be doing that I'm not doing, what I should stop doing that I am doing. Uh, where am I? Where am I headed? And, and I just dig deeper and deeper into the weeds, all with a great motive of wanting to walk with God, you know, more dynamically. And, and so I just get so many details and I get down in the we weeds. And you might say in that mindset, we can be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. And I see that among believers sometimes that they just get so wrapped up in the details of Christian living that they forget that God calls it a walk. Sometimes the, the view from 30,000 feet is the best view where we're down here and we're trying to figure things out. It's, it's like when Paul prayed and cried out to the Lord Jesus and he said, I've got this thorn in the flesh. And he cried out three times, take this thorn away from me. Very specific. And the answer was a little more 30,000 feet. The response was, my grace is sufficient for thee. My favor is enough for you. And a lot of times we need to remember to grab the simplicity that's in Christ and zoom up a little higher and say, you know, from up here, everything is just great. You know, living forever, eternity, and eternal vision. And the idea of walking with God is, is broad enough to keep me from coming to a stop down in the weeds. So that's the challenge that I'm trying to overcome today. Next slide, please. I, I saw this recently that I thought that I liked it. This is from Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher. You might have heard of him. Uh, he said, life is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. 
Sometimes we see our life like a problem that we need to solve. Like when I was born, God gave me a problem, and then I, my whole life I'm trying to solve the Kevin problem. You're not a problem. You're not a problem to you, and you're not a problem to God, and you're not a problem to the rest of us. You're a wonderful child of the King. You're in a royal household. You're more than a conqueror. You can do all things through Christ, all the great scriptures. Life's not a problem to be solved. This is from a philosopher, for goodness sakes. There are some places in, in scripture where the inspired scripture is quoting a, a phrase that has been said in their culture, even. That happens even in scripture because it's meaningful. Uh, so learn from everywhere. Sometimes God will teach you from a lot of different places. He also said, life can only be understood backward, but it must, must be lived forward. You might have heard that before. I hope that's not d- too deep for you for a Sunday morning there. Now you got Kevin's up here quoting philosophers, look out. <laughs> we, we understand more about our life looking back on things, about what we did and didn't do, about mistakes and victories, but it, it can't be lived that way. Like we say, that the, the uh, we've said many times that the rear view mirror is a lot smaller than the windshield, right? That's for a reason. And we're moving forward, and that's the idea of walking with God. Walking, walking, walking uh, is a, a lot to do with what we do as believers. And in Scripture, uh, to live your life is often described using the terms of ambulation or body language of movement. Scripture talks about feet, about standing, about stepping, following path, stumbling, about our journey, our way, our direction, even running. You could do a whole study on running. Run the way of the Word. Uh, Paul used all those terms, and the New Testament authors used those terms. We get so excited when a baby first steps. Maybe that's happened to you recently about a grandchild or a nephew or a niece where you see them walking for the first time and you know if it's your first baby you're plastering it all over Facebook look I created a human being and it can ambulate it can move with its legs you know my baby walked three days before any baby in the neighborhood you know <laughs> Ah, the excitement of walking for the first time. You know, sometimes I think our spiritual walk needs to be a little bit more like this. We need to be a little bit simpler in Christ, not be corrupted from the simplicity in Christ, for goodness sakes, as we're trying to figure everything out. One thing I'd like you to do right now, look at your feet. I'd like you to take a minute and look at your shoes, look at your feet. Take just a minute, if you would. Look at your feet. See there? God talks in Scripture about your feet. Susie, your feet are in the Word. Because they represent where your life is going. In Scripture, your feet represent where your life is moving, where it's going. Father, right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bless the feet of these saints I bless their toes, I bless their ankles, I bless their legs and knees and hips. I speak wholeness in all of these body parts, the muscles, the flow of of, uh, blood, uh, no buildup of anything that shouldn't be there, liquid or otherwise. I speak wholeness into legs, strength into knees and thighs and calves. I speak wholeness to ankles and toes and feet, Father, bless these feet that they take each person, and also on live streaming, bless those feet in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they are beautiful feet, and they will take these people to great places to speak your word, to represent Jesus to this world by where these feet take us. Father, bless the feet of the saints today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I hope you, when you looked at your shoes, you didn't have a a pair of these. I don't know if you want to want to buy any of these. I want to see Carl wearing a pair of these things. Come on now. Some somebody's got a little little too much time in their 
their creative design, but somebody will make anything. You think about how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the good news. You read that one before? You got beautiful feet, Nancy. Isn't it wild that God would say that by inspired scripture? And then Ephesians 6, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. That's in the armor. My wife reminded me of this one. That's in the list of the armor of God. Your feet are in the armor of God and what you put on those feet. Uh, there's a lot of translations of this verse that are, are quite different, but they all have something about the feet, something about readiness, uh, the covering of the feet, the readiness, and that that brings uh, the gospel and peace. By where you go, you bring peace. You bring the peace of God. That's how you let the peace of God rule is where your feet take you. If you were wondering, the Mayo Clinic says we average in America three to 4,000 steps a day, if you were wondering, with these feet of yours. And uh, that's a mile and a half to two miles a day on average. Uh, some among us maybe are on the 10,000 step thing. That might, if you hear a thumping sound, there might be somebody in the room getting some of theirs in as they're sitting here. I don't know. Can you do that sitting down? Do they let you do that? I don't know. Of course, you've got to have a special watch, or you can't do that. You gotta, um, anyway, uh, the 10,000 step thing is five miles. Most people average a bit less than that. The other thing from In Touch Ministries, I saw this quote, based on the biblical accounts of Jesus' ministry, his travels spanned at least 50 miles side to side, east to west, in Israel, in the Palestine area there, because it's a tall, skinny space there, and 150 miles north to south from Dan to Beersheba, they said in the Old Testament, uh, from Caesarea Philippi up north down to the Dead Sea down there. Uh, so Jesus would have covered more than 15,000 miles during his lifetime. They were walking. If they didn't have a donkey or a horse, there was a whole lot of walking going on every single day. Wilf, can you picture that? A lot of walking going on. That's why there's so much about, you know, cleaning your feet when you enter a space. I'm not going to get into this deeply, but the three of the, the key words for, for walking, uh, the base word to tread, pateo, peripateo, is, is the main word. The one in the middle here is the main word when you read in your New Testament anything about walking, and it's used oodles of times, right around oodles. I counted them. It's oodles. <laughs> Can't remember the number. But the peri part, when you put the Greek prefix peri, it means around. So you're treading around, hyper-literally walking in Scripture. Walking with God is walking around with God. That's, if you're going to be ultra-literal about it, it's walking around with God. And then this other word is more of a military procession in, in order of your, your walking. You think way back in Genesis... They, it says they could hear the sound of God walking in the garden. Unfortunately, that's when they went and hid. You know. But it, I find it interesting that, that he brings up the idea of God walking. That's very figurative language. God is spirit. God doesn't have feet. But that is a, a condescension. That is uh, a personification of the spirit of God as spirit, as if he was a person, as if he was walking, as if he had toenails, right? And that helps us picture, as Tanya would say, imagination. It helps us to picture God walking in the garden. Then Genesis 3.15, interestingly enough, uh, the, that God promised the, uh, the serpent there that uh, there would be enmity between the serpent seed and uh, the woman's seed, capital S, the woman's seed, and that it would bruise the head of the serpent, and, it, and yet the serpent would, would nip the heel of, uh, of the Savior, the coming Savior, all the way back in Genesis 3.15. But it's the heel that's mentioned. Interesting, the idea of walking and the feet already brought up back there. Romans 4.12 reminds us that we are to walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had. It's got the word footsteps in there. The, the idea of his example, the footsteps, the walking, the moving forward. That's our prayer for uh, ourselves today is that we, we 
have the simplicity that's in Christ to move forward. Sometimes you, you, you want to be, fro- you get frozen in fear and you stop moving forward. You get mired up in the details. But we are to walk in the footsteps of the faith of our father, that Father Abraham had. I read Genesis this week, the whole shebang, and blew my mind about all the stuff they did and the uh, crazy families they had and the weirdness. It's a weird bunch of people doing weird things. If, if you think the Bible is a book of great examples to follow everything they did, you haven't read it lately. Most of the examples are a few highs and a whole lot of lows. And that should be an example to you about how to walk and not walk, right? Uh, it's, it's real. The footsteps of faith. <clears throat> the don't walk stuff, just as you read across, I just looked at a lot of the, the scriptures that talk about what to walk in. We don't walk in darkness. We don't walk in the flesh. We don't walk according to the course of this world. We don't walk uh, according to the prince of the power of the air. We don't walk as the Gentiles. We don't walk as the unwise. We don't walk by sight. So what do we walk in? A lot of scriptures, these are right from verses that talk about walking. We walk in integrity. We walk in righteousness. We walk in His name. We walk in His statutes or commandments. We walk with wise people. So a lot of the walking we do is with somebody else, like I was walking with Levi that morning. We walk, according to Scripture, in or by the Spirit. We walk in newness of life. We walk in love. We walk in light. We walk in wisdom. We walk circumspectly. That's that word, accurately. We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk worthy of our calling. Galatians 5.25 is one of the great scriptures on this subject. If we live by the Spirit, Paul said, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And that's that word that is more of a a military walking in line or walking in order. Uh, If we say that we, that's that zoe word, if we say we live in the Spirit or we live by the Spirit, then let's keep in step with the direction of the Holy Spirit. If we we say, hey, I'm born again, I've got the Spirit, it's Christ in me, it's Christ in me. Well, keep in step with Christ in you. And not everybody's going to understand what the Christ in you is doing or saying or directing you to do. Not everybody's going to get it. Because you need to be, we need to be in step with the Spirit, in step with the Spirit, in order to proceed in order with the direction of the Spirit. That's why faithfulness, I say sometimes, faithfulness is not always doing the same thing for God every day. Well, at least He did such and such every day, you know, for 10 years. Well, that's not necessarily faithfulness. Faithfulness is not just repetition. I've been in service clubs like Rotary and some other clubs, and people want to, they don't want to miss a meeting for 50 years so they can get their 50-year pin. Praise God for that, but maybe God's not telling you. Maybe God's telling you to change your job when you're 67 years old. Maybe He's telling you something else that not everybody will understand. But faithfulness is doing the will of God in your walking with God, since life is a walk faithfulness is doing what he wants you to do today it's not necessarily a discipline to repeat the same thing over and over i mean if you might be one of the people that can't do the same thing two days in a row it drives you crazy some people are kind of wired that way i don't know but uh it's not just repetition that we're after in keeping in step with the spirit I found that the Greek phrasing there is, is so interesting in that verse in Galatians. Uh, pneumati, with the Spirit or by the Spirit. And in the Greek there, it basically says, live pneumati, pneumati we should walk. So it's the same word twice, just sitting there in a row in, in the Greek language there in that verse. I find that super interesting. I can tell you're all so excited about that. Um, anyway, our walk against our adversary so you ever read Ephesians 6 with the, the uh, 
the armor of God, the armor of God says to stand for some things and stand against some things. We are called to stand for certain things and we are called to stand against certain things. That is a part of your walk. That is a part of our walk with God is to stand for certain things and stand against other things. Well, Kevin, just give me a list of the things I'm supposed to stand for. No, that's some of that's obvious, but some of it's not so obvious, and you and the Lord got to figure that out. Second Corinthians, I want to start in this category of standing, uh, walking against the adversary, because a part of our walk with God is a walk against the enemy. A part of our walk with God is walking a- a- against the enemy, standing against the enemy. And in 2 Corinthians 6.16, has the idea of God Himself walking around. We are the temple of the living God, you see, just as God said, I will live among them, He's quoting the Old Testament, and walk about with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. To walk about with them. That is, God is moving forward with you. He's he's proceeding. He's going forward. He's not stagnant. He's not frozen in fear like we get sometimes. I don't know about you, but sometimes I know there's certain things I need to do or certain people I need to talk to, and I don't do it because I get frozen in fear. And fear keeps us from acting. We think we're going to make a mistake. We think we're going to be wrong. We think our reputation will be affected. What will people think? See, God is walking about. That's that peripateo word. God's walking about with you. I I think that's pretty exciting. That's a good confession, isn't it? Well, the devil walks about too. You know this one, don't you? (laughs) You know this one. A lot of this just comes from, I I, I don't want to overemphasize word studies because I think that there are limitations, but is if, if walk is the thing that's burning in your soul, well, read the scriptures that talk about walking. And in fact, there haven't been hundreds of them, but I kind of filtered through a lot of these. Um, and ideas and meaning that are life changing comes out of scripture. Reading scripture should change your life. It's not just so you can say, well, I read Genesis this week. No, it, it should be life changing. You should be closer to God by reading scripture, just like you're closer to God by prayer right? We're Bible-fed, Spirit-led. Be sober-minded, be watchful, Peter is writing. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to what? Devour. God walks around in us, in the previous verse, among us, with us. In this verse, our enemy prowls around. And that's that same peripateo word, that's the same basic word for walking around. But when, when it's talking about a lion and an adversary, a lot of translators change it to prowling instead of it literally it's just walking around. But it, it cha- they change it to prowling because it's, it's uh, an animal-based translation. Isn't that interesting? So, God walks around, the devil walks around, and, and we walk around. <clears throat> There's a song in there from the 50s or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> a little flashback there. Uh, like a roaring lion. What's the roaring lion we always say he wants to do? He wants to roar, Paul, so that he can uh, freeze his prey in the tracks. The lion roars to us in quiet ways sometimes, gets us thinking about something we shouldn't be thinking about. And we get to thinking on that thing for a day and then a week and then a month and then six months go by and we, uh, we develop this big imagination of, of something that wasn't really a problem but we, we cultivated it and we polished it so much. You know, sometimes we have our, our little problem or our challenge and we carry it around like a justification of every bad decision we start making. We polish it, we put our little name on it, we carry it around. Well, well, Kevin, what, what about this? How you doing? What are you struggling with? Well, you know, it's, it's my problem here. I, you know, it's, uh, and we, we, sometimes we wear our challenges like a badge. 
we use it to kind of justify being afraid and not moving forward. That's not walking. That's allowing the lion to freeze you in the tra- tracks. I find that interesting too that it says seeking someone to the de- devour. Is our adversary a seeker also? Yeah. yeah. He not only walks around like God walks around, he seeks. What does God seek? Seeking those to worship him. John 4, 24. God seeks worshipers. The devil seeks someone to devour. Who do you want to follow? <laughs> you, want to, you want to follow someone that wants to gobble you up? Or you want to follow someone that is asking for your worship? God's not a narcissist when he's asking for worship. He knows that when you worship him, it puts you in the greatest place a human being can be. That's why he wants your worship. It's appropriate to him, and it's the very best place that you'll ever be is at the feet of God. You know, there's, uh, that reminds me, there's, there's two great places at the throne of God that I think about, that sort of locations, at the, if you picture the throne of God. We talk a lot about being up in Daddy's lap, you know, the intimacy of hugging Daddy, but also the fear of God the awesome respect of God at God's feet, falling at God's feet, we're talking about today, is such a great, great place. It's not all up in daddy's lap, and it's not all down at feet in awesome respect. It's both. It's both. Two great places on the throne, daddy's lap and the fear of the Lord. If you fear God, you need fear nothing else. Right? Of course, that fear means respect. That's what they meant using it that way, respect. So God's a seeker, the devil's a seeker, and we are seekers too. <clears throat> Again, we're talking about the category of our walk against our adversary of the three categories we're on to today. Luke ten nineteen, when the 70, or the Greek translation, some of them say 72, but when the 70 returned, Jesus sent them out like ambassadors, And when they came back telling all these stories of the great things that happened, uh, that's even in the the, uh, Chosen series when the 70 came back. This verse, Jesus said this, one of the things, uh, when when he said he saw lightning fall from heaven, do you remember that? Here he said, behold, I've given you authority to tread, that's our walking word here, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. That's our confession. That's our, that's our proclamation. That's our declaration. Nothing's going to hurt me because I am going to tread. Jesus told them at, when they came back, he said, the reason you got all these great stories is because I've given you the exousia power, the authority to tread, to walk, And walk on what? Serpents and scorpions, yes, in a physical sort of sense. Walk on your physical problems, stay above and crush your physical problems, but that you would tread over all the power of the enemy. That's a great confession. That's a great confession. And if he gave it to them, they didn't have Pentecost yet, did they? They didn't have God in Christ in them yet. They had Holy Spirit representation temporarily, conditionally upon them in certain situations, but it wasn't in them as a born-again seed yet. Goodness sakes, we have, Julie, the authority and the power to tread, to walk, not just walk with God, but to walk on our enemy, to tread on all the power of the enemy. You got to let that sink in. We have the God-given authority as a part of our walk with God to walk on our enemy. There, there's a reason why there's an arch in your foot, <laughs> live streamers. There's a reason there's an arch in both feet, you might say, a preacher's example, and that's, it fits nicely on the neck of the adversary. Uh, that arch in your foot, if it helps you to confess that. Of course, you probably quickly thought of Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. There's Tom's word grace from last week. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. I always found this interesting that it is a reminder that it's the God of peace. The God of peace that will crush Satan under your feet shortly, Butch. If I was writing this, I'd have said, the God of almighty power and thunderbolts will crush Satan under your feet. The muscular God of dynamic metabolism, e pluribus unum, or something or other. But it's the God of peace that crushes the enemy. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Let the peace of God run your life. There's power in these things. We always talk about, we think about the power of God in casting out devils, the power of God in commanding healing. But we need the power of God for peace. We need the power of God for each of the fruit of the Spirit. We need the power of God for every prayer to be answered. We need the power of the Holy Spirit for endurance and persistence and steadfastness. We need the muscular power of God to, to be faithful. Not just when we are, you know, building up a testimony but just to walk with God, we need His dynamic power. Most of the time, it's to, to see us through our Christian life. Life is a walk. It should take some pressure off of us to think of our Christian life as being a walk and not just a problem to solve or an analysis, a hyper-analysis or tweezers and a magnifying glass and uh, 10 meetings with a counselor to necessarily, and you might need all of this at some time, but it, you're not a problem and your life is not a problem. You've got challenges, of course, but we look at them from 30,000 feet sometimes and that takes the pressure off of us and God just says, well, just keep walking, just keep walking. But God, what about, just keep walking, stay the course. Stay the course. Just keep walking. Well, what should I be doing that I'm not doing? You're doing all the great stuff. In fact, I would say for most of you in the room and on live streaming, most of us, most of the time, are living the kind of life that God had in mind for us to live. Or you probably wouldn't be listening to my voice right now. But Kevin, if you knew all the weird stuff I've done and I never told anybody and the things I was thinking last week and he knows you're weird. He knows, he know, he's not shocked. He's shocked when you act like you're not weird. That's what shocks him. And that's why you needed a savior, right? Perfection is not a Chevy with all the parts not missing. Perfection is maturity. Perfection is just living with God. Perfection is just doing your utmost for his highest. That's what biblical perfection is. Western perfection is an assembly line and you're building Chevys and you, you got this bolt and it always goes in there and you got it in there so you know everything is in the place. That's not, that's not in the Bible. The Bible tells us to be perfect. You, I was talking to somebody on the phone this week about that. But biblical perfection is being fully equipped spiritually. Biblical, biblical maturity is being mature and growing. It's not having reached something, it's the journey toward a virtuous, sacred thing. That is biblical perfection. Enough of this Western idea of perfection. My hair is in the right place. I got used a six, six pack of gel this morning. You know, it, it's, that's not perfection. Perfection is not looking right and smelling right. Crushing Satan under your feet that word crush there is to, to rub with a grinding action. And it was also used, the, the word for crush there, in Mark 5, 4, the chains were broken on the man in the Gadarenes. You remember that? One of the gospels says it was two guys. It might have been, it probably was two, and they were just talking about one of them. And the man of the Gadarenes, the chains were broken and the word broken is this word for crush here. I find that interesting that, that the crushing of chains in a possessed man, that word crush is used here in Romans 16, 20 about how the God of peace crushes Satan under your feet. And the word quickly or shortly is the adverb thrown in there. That's the time frame. And that's a confession. This is a great confession. 
In fact, a, a classical Greek scholar that I read about, she said that that Greek term meant in, in culture to beat into jelly. And I can't even tell you where that came from, but she quoted a classical author like Plutarch or one of those, those guys that were writing around that time that uh, used that word for crush to beat into jelly. Picture your problems getting beat into jelly. These mountains of mountains that we've developed things. Well, the God of peace wants to beat into jelly, to crush it with a grinding action under the arch in your foot. Step, 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 crush and grind, crush and grind. Step, 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 crush and grind, crush and grind. Step, 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 crush and grind, crush and grind. Whatever it takes for you to remember that on the way out the door, when the officer pulls you over, you just say, well, I know I was going 94 miles an hour, but I was acting out the sermon. All right. Our walk with Jesus. For this you've been called, and this is in a section talking about, actually about slaves, bond slaves, people who were paying off a, a debt owed. They were, they were bond slaves. And he was telling them how to be a bond slave and yet still, um, still walk as a dynamic believer. For to this you've been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow what? In his steps. There's another one of those step words, follow in his steps. We follow in the steps of Jesus. And sometimes we're going to suffer when that's happening. But we still follow in his steps. That word steps could be translated footsteps or footprints. Scripture literally says that we follow in the footprints of Jesus. That's literally exactly what that says. We follow in the footsteps, the footprints of Jesus. Where he puts his foot, I put my foot. This is how you learn to walk with God. Following Jesus teaches us how to walk with God. That's the idea. <laughs> That's the whole idea of him. You know, Hebrews chapter 1 says, well, you used to learn about God this way and this way and this way. Lately, you've been learning about God through Jesus, the one he sent. See, we follow in his footsteps, in his footprints. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so what? Walk in Him. Walk in Him. One translation reads, so live your lives with Him. Since you've received Christ in you, the hope of glory, live your life with Him. Chris, that is Christianity in this verse. I love a verse that summarizes my entire Christian life. My entire Christian life is walking in Him. My entire Christian life is literally walking around with Jesus. That's what Scripture says. That's not just a poetic, catchy bumper sticker. This is what Scripture says. That living your Christian life is walking around with Jesus. Oh, Kevin, that just is a, yeah, that's right. That's what the Bible is saying. I only do what the words... I, we got to get back to the Word. Well, get back to the Word. It says you've received Christ Jesus the, the Lord, so walk around with Christ Jesus. Christ is not a name. It's, it's the anointed one. Jesus is His name. Lord is a title. Christ is a title. We're talking about the anointed Jesus who is your life leader, right? Christ Jesus the Lord, the anointed Jesus who your, is your life leader. Live your lives with Him. Paul wrote to the Colossians toward the, the very end of the book of Acts. I find that fascinating, that verse. Jeremiah says, O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own what? It's not in man. This is why the world, there's 8 billion people in the world right now, and most people are confused about who they are, what they want to do, you know, 
what they can get from somebody else, Jesus is the only answer to every question of every nation, every marriage, every family, every job, every culture, every society. Jesus really, and that's not a religious thing, he's the only answer to every problem in the world. He's the way. And here, the the Greek of the Old Testament is, is that word hodos. It means a path, it means a journey. The way of man is not in himself. But what do we tell people to do? We tell them to look inside yourself, find yourself. See, it's not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. This is why people are so publicly and privately full of hate and greed and lust and disappointment and depression. You ever try to use one of these to find your way, your, your way, find the way, you know, and sometimes I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll be on my phone and I'll say, what do you mean it'll take a month to get to Columbus? A month? Well, I have it on walk instead of drive, right? Hey, were you and I were talking about this recently, I think. If you got it on walk, it's going to tell you how long it'll take to walk there, right? It's like it took Jesus three or four days to walk from Sea of Galilee to Jerusalem. These people were on foot all the time. So no wonder it comes up in Scripture that you're living your life is called walking with God. So sometimes you got to make sure you're not on the walk part, you're on the drive part of that. Jesus said, you know this verse, John 14, 6, I am the path, that's that same word, hodos, I am the way. This translation calls it the path. I am the path, the truth, and the energy of life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the path. Not only does he show us the GPS about how to get somewhere, Linda, he himself is the path. He shows us the path, He Himself is the path, and He escorts us along the path. No wonder I ought to be thinking about Him all the time. How in the world, if Romans 8.29 says the purpose in your life is to be conformed into His image, how in the world are you going to be conformed into His image if He rarely comes to your mind? It can't even work, right? And again, it's not a religious thing. No wonder Jesus wanted to wash feet. Can you imagine your feet right now and two hands of the Lord Jesus holding your feet that we prayed for and blessed earlier? The two hands of Jesus holding your feet, which would represent how He is healing you and he is guiding you into the progress you're moving forward you're walking you're living forward your progression the hands of jesus washing your feet what that must have been like it's the highest place in the room is at the feet of the saints we touch with his touch we serve we have a servant's heart Jesus taught leadership from the floor. The the feet of the saints is the holy place in service to God's people. When he wanted to train leaders, he didn't call them up on a stage. He called them to the floor to wash the feet of the saints. That's dynamic, powerful leadership. It's not above people. Tom said this the other day. It's not being up above people and hauling them up to your plateau of spirituality it's calling them down to the service at the feet of the saints blessing their feet no wonder he talked a lot about feet we're wrapping up here so whoever says he abides or lives in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked first john 2 6 if you say you abide with god you remain with god you live and dwell with god then you're wanting to walk like Jesus walked, live like he lived, behave like he behaved, think like he thinks, speak like he speaks. 
And of course, Mark reminds us at the last verses of Mark, when we walk with him, signs walk with us. They follow us. And in walking, you think about, you might think about this, maybe you thought about this before. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the, midst, in the presence of mine enemies, right? Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus read that. We are walking with that. We keep in step with the Spirit, and we are living the kind of life that God had in mind because our life is a walk. So take the pressure off. Sometimes take the view from 30,000 feet when you get stuck down in the weeds of trying to hyperanalyze your Christian life. And let's uh, let the walk uh, simplify our hearts as we are walking. Part of that walking is stepping on the works of the enemy. That's part of our walk with God. And then our walk with Jesus is the answer to everything. So thanks for your time today and being patient with us. Debbie, thanks for for coming today and the music today was amazing with voice of praise thanks for all you do you folks so we love you that's what we'll do today and next week i think tom sarah is back on right okay love you see ya thanks for being with us